Good morning. Um, we, I have a, a, quite a few taxa to, to show uh, in the genus Psilocybe, uh, which is my original forte and uh, center of, of my studies at the Evergreen State College. I uh, went to the Evergreen State College in 1977, 1976, um, directly after uh, spending time as a hippie logger setting chokers in the mountains. And then I had a hang gliding accident, some of you know about that, nearly killed me, and I decided it was time for me to take a different direction in life, because I was definitely on a, on a death mission, it seemed. Of, um, and mushrooms were a particular interest to me, and so I went to the Evergreen State College, and the, because of a series of, of unique circumstances and coincidences, I was kind of at the right place at the right time, and ended up... Uh, being uh, tutored by some of the fathers of mycology uh, in North America, Dr. Alexander Smith, as well as, well as Dr. Daniel Stuntz. And then I built a strong relationship with Dr. Gaston Guzman uh, from Veracruz, Mexico, who is the foremost world authority on the genus Psilocybe. And in 1978 or uh, 1977, around that period of time, he came to the United States, and we spent several weeks together uh, traveling up and down the uh, coast of the Northwest and uh, collecting specimens for his monograph. And uh, the, his monograph on the genus Psilocybe uh, still stands as the best work ever published on the subject. And uh, I was honored to, to be um, his, one of the, his most major contributors to that monograph. All my work on, the, on, on, on these mushrooms was covered uh, by a Drug Enforcement Administration license uh, that, that is still uh, in effect uh, uh, through the Evergreen State College. Now I have to be, I'm very, very careful uh, because of my business and people have to understand that I'm, I'm self-censored. Nobody has ever come to me saying, Paul, you, don't, you shouldn't talk about this. Uh, I've never had any, any interference with the government. I have been bribed or attempt, people have attempted to bribe me probably dozens of times with huge amounts of money and it doesn't matter. I don't care how much money people offer me. I will not uh, sell cultures. I will not give cultures away. Uh, and I won't be involved in anybody. And it's kind of, you know, it's kind of fun. You know, people offer me money and I says, not enough, more, more. No, it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter how much money you offer me, I will not get involved in other people's uh, cultivation uh, efforts uh, of psilocybin mushrooms. So I've been, in, in the same respect, I've been extremely good at disservicing my own profit wheel. There's about three ways I could have made millions of dollars in this mushroom scene. Uh, one is with the chanterelle and the wild mushroom harvest in Washington State. I live in Mason County, the gold belt of the chanterelle harvest, and I could have uh, involved myself in that years ago, uh, but I had moral problems with uh, the issues of over-harvesting, and I just didn't feel it was, it was sustainable. And many of us uh, people hunting wild mushrooms, when you come into a forest in the aftermath of commercial har harvesters, you know, it's extremely depressing because everything's been wiped clear. Uh, the kombucha uh, craze that has swept this country now four times this century. Most of you heard about kombucha two years ago. It was, we were getting 10 to 20 phone calls a day for it. And I've been growing it for over 15 years and could have easily profited from that. The third, third way I could have made a lot of money is selling spore prints uh, of psilocybe mushrooms, which are legal uh, in this country. California, there is a state law against it. Uh, but the federal statutes specifically mention any substance containing salts or isomers of psilocybin or psilocin uh, are prohibited. Uh, when it comes to marijuana, they mention the, the genus uh, uh, cannabis, uh, and they mention cannabinols. When it comes to peyote, they mention peyote uh, and mescaline. Uh, when it, the federal statutes uh, come to mushrooms, they're not mentioned at all. So there is, there is kind of like a hole in the law, and there are many companies selling spore prints uh, legally, uh, and they continue to do so. Uh, I, uh, I chose not to, and um, you know I have to pay my phone bills, and I have to pay all my other utility bills, etc. So sometimes I kick myself in the pants, but not for very long, because I realized the path that I chose was, was I think, ethically the correct one. So I am an expert on the genus Psilocybe. I um, know quite a bit about it, um, and my specialty has been taxonomy in the, in the genus Psilocybe, the cultivation work that I did was specifically to be able to grow up material for my scanning electron microscopy 
uh, and the other work that we did at, at the Irvine State College. Um, and to date now, I have four species that I've published in the scientific literature in Latin uh, in reputable mycological journals. And I have uh, two or three more taxa that are kind of in the wings. Now, at the same time, I don't go out mushroom hunting every day, and I don't understand how these species come to me. Uh, I really believe that there is some sort of conscious uh, response or uh, solicitation. I, I, I tend to find these things, and I don't quite understand how I find them. And uh, they, they just kind of come to me. Well, three weeks ago, Dusty and I were hiking up in the Olympics and was on a five-day um, high alpine excursion. And we were walking up the trail, and she found a group of mushrooms. And I said, oh, wow, interesting. It looks like gallerinas, you know, from looking down. And the, gen the genus gallerina, there are many deadly poison species, and uh, which is just poetic uh, humor that I think that these mushrooms have. Because when I leaned down and picked the mushrooms, they had a purple-brown spore print. And they weren't gallerinas. They were psilocybes. And the Solduck River Basin, uh, which is, goes into ancient old growth, uh, has a unique uh, mushroom flora there. And this, this collection that we found, I'm 90% I'm convinced, is a new species. And it's just these things just happen to me. And I don't really claim credit for it. And I want to emphasize that as much as I can, is that I'm a vehicle for communication, but I don't own these ideas. These ideas are much greater than any one person. So at the same time, I'm going to give you a lot of information on genus philosophy and taxonomy and how to accurately identify these mushrooms, at least to exclude poisonous species. Um, but beyond that, I will not answer any, uh, any questions on cultivation. You know? And please don't be offended. If you're smart enough, you can just look at cultivation of Stropharia rugosa annulata or other wood decomposing species that share similar temperature climes and preferences for habitat, and you can draw your own conclusions. Um, but if you deal with fungi perfecti, and I apologize to anybody here who's called up fungi perfecti and says, listen, I want to get spore prints of Slosby cubensis. We say, we don't sell them. And I said, I want to order a pressure cooker. We say, I'm sorry, we will not sell to you. So that's the end of our conversation. All of our employees signed contracts. Two employees have been fired for answering questions. Not because anybody told me to do this. This is, this is my own you know, personal direction of my employees because I want to stay in this industry for life. And I feel that by not directly encouraging the cultivation of psilocybin mushrooms, I can help the whole, everybody interested in that subject as well. So, you know, 98% uh, of our business truly is supplying the gourmet and medicinal mushroom trade. Anybody who spent any time at our facility can see what we're really doing there. And the, the projects that we have going on are extremely exciting. I think they're revolutionary. They're, they're, they have potential for uh, curing this planet of many ills and helping human health. And that is the bigger picture. And if philosophies were my vehicle or my doorway into the mushroom scene, then I'm extremely grateful and thankful to them for that. So just please understand my position because it's one that I have to very carefully uh, walk and, and watch. No one's asked for our mailing list. And if they did ask for our mailing list, they get a whole bunch of people from Iowa and Nebraska, you know, who are retirees are buying oyster and shiitake kits because that is our mailing list, you know. Um, so, with that caveat, I want to have the lights off, and then we can rock and roll here. Um, I have, uh, oh, where's my pointer? Um, this is a, a photograph from Peter First. The photographs I'm going to show today, uh, most of the photographs I've been showing for the past uh, two talks, are, are most all of them have been mine. This slideshow is a collection of photographs, and I want to give acknowledgement to uh, Peter First, to Gary Linkoff, uh, to uh, Giorgio Samarini, uh, uh, there's several from Dr. Mosier uh, in, in Europe, uh, and uh, Scott Redhead and a few other individuals, uh, Dr. Ola as well. And I don't, I'm not going to specifically individualize every photograph to the, to the photographer, but they're, they're credited in, in, in my most recent book, Psilocybin Mushrooms of the World. This is from southern Mexico, about 500 years AD. And I think it illustrates what we all share in common. This is probably the, one of the, the many of the uh, ancient mushroom conferences, you know, and the celebration of mushrooms. <laughs> and I think all of us feel the same as, as these Mesoamericans did, you know, uh, nearly uh, um, uh, 500 years ago. Um, so it, it is through art that we know much about the history of the use of mushrooms. And all of you who are artists out there who are poor and struggling, I hope you bear in mind is that, uh, you know, civilizations have been studied 
through the art and the artifacts that have remained and been preserved through time. So the great thing about these conferences also, and one of the sorry things I think about the Grateful Dead disbanding, is that there's a whole subculture of artists who do, do all sorts of mushroom motifs and mushroom work that's just incredibly beautiful. And these people spent a lot of time, you know, uh, making, making these artworks. So I, I hope all of you who are artists, you know, continue making mushroom motifs, et cetera, and, and the art with mushroom themes, because I think it, it will survive through time. And we'll, you know, century from now from now, a uh, century from now, anthropologists will, will look back at this period and say, well, what is the art of its time? In that regard, Christian Retsch, who was here last year, has produced an excellent book, which is about, I think, a thousand pages long, just came out, it's in German, and it's the Cyclopedia of, uh, of Psychedelic Plants. Uh, and in what Christian does, which I love about his work, is that he goes back a thousand, two thousand years, shows the entire timeline and the use of mushrooms throughout many cultures throughout the world, and then he takes it through the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the early 90s. So he treats it as a continuum. He is a true you know, ethnomycologist in that respect, but he doesn't stop the timeline you know, at R. Gordon Wasson. He continues it all the way to the present. So I highly recommend his book. It is in German. It just came out. Uh, he's got an excellent section on mushrooms. Okay, in northern Algeria, Algeria uh, about 5, 000, uh, five to 6,000 years ago, there's some reports that we're putting these, these drawings now about seven to 8,000 years ago. Uh, in northern Algeria, at the Tassila, at the Tassili Enajar Plateau, which literally translates as a plateau of running rivers, um, there was found um, a huge complex of uh, caves, which is the largest repository, they believe, of cave art in the world. I think there's 60,000 images have been, uh, have been recorded so far. Uh, Northern Algeria now, of course, has been encroached by the Sahara Desert. But several thousand years ago, 12,000 years ago, the end of the Ice Age, and uh, as the ice age, as the glaciers receded, of course, you know, uh, there was lots of rivers and deciduous woodlands and, and conifer woodlands flourished. And so this area was once resplendent with water. In 1947, a, um, a uh, Japanese and French uh, anthropologist photographer team uh, named Lotte um, and I think Yamaguchi uh, traveled to northern Algeria, and, and they were documenting and photographing all of these, uh, all of these cave art uh, pictographs. And you know, they were running out of water, and they sent one of their emissaries uh, down in search for water. And he traveled through a, a complex labyrinthine uh, cave system, and he went deep into the recesses of this cave network. And there's this great uh, report uh, describing how he lifted his lantern up and after he entered this large, unique, circular cavern, which looked like a shamanic den. And as he lifted his lantern, he almost dropped it because this image hovered overhead. Now, at that time, and, and until recently, it is bizarre to imagine that anthropologists could not figure out what this image was. <laughs> Obviously, the artist is very excited about mushrooms. I mean, really excited about mushrooms. And the fact that it's associated closely with a bee face, uh, many of you well know, even today, uh, many people preserve magic mushrooms and honey. Uh, and uh, the honey then, you know, uh, because it's, it has high in sugar and prevents bacteria from growing, uh, preserves the mushrooms for a long time, and it's a traditional way of, of keeping these, these specimens in good shape. Um, I believe that the fermentation then, uh, which would occur on some level, uh, of the honey would create a psychoactive mead, a psychoactive beer. Uh, and Christian Rech also has done an excellent uh, study on psychoactive beers of early Europe, and he agrees with me that likely uh, the magic mushrooms are also uh, added to the early meads, uh, etc. So I think this, this is naturally fits. Uh, if you were preserving these mushrooms in honey, you would be making a psycho so the psychoactive beer with that uh, groups of the beer, uh, groups of the honey that would ferment. So I think we all are part of a continuum through history. And I think our knowledge and appreciation of mushrooms is, is hopefully cumulative, oftentimes not, but we're all part of a bigger picture. And our love and fascination for mushrooms, you know, we're all carrying the torch now and we'll pass it down from one generation to, to another generation. I do own a Mesoamerican mushroom stone that Peter first helped me get that's about 500 years BC. And I feel truly I'm just a custodian of this artifact. Uh, and there must have been 20 or 30 other individuals who were custodians as well. So it's just being passed through history. And I believe the torch needs to be passed to our children and then passed further on. 
Okay, the mushroom likely that they were, they were using in northern Algeria is this one. Gary Linkoff uh, found this uh, on, a, uh, uh, on, a, on a pine uh, uh, cone, uh, Pinus canaster, I believe, and it's Philosophy Marii. And this is a very exciting find. And Gary uh, and Mandy Sol uh, Salzman and Joanne's uh, travels around the world have been exceptionally beneficial to me because they've been able to go to regions and take photographs of things that I have not been able to collect. So this one is, it still was recently collected in Algeria, which you know, is a, probably a remnant of a much larger population of psilocybes that were resident at the time that there were deciduous woodlands and there was, and the, and there was lots of running rivers. But as, as, the, as the desert environment you know, expanded, of course, these species became a lot less uh, frequent in their occurrence. And then the ritual use of them probably died out because of lack of, lack of availability. Um, Mesoamerican mushroom stones, um, there's so several excellent books on them. There's one that's uh, funded by the Japanese Tobacco Institute, uh, working with a nun in Guatemala, who I would love to see come to this conference sometime. Uh, her name is, is Yvonne Summerkamp, and she has uh, uh, now been elevated as a, as a mother of a convent. And she has spent a lot of her time studying the, the use of magic mushrooms and with particular emphasis on mushroom stones uh, in Mesoamerica. They produce an excellent book on the etymology of mushroom stones and the historical uh, trend of their development. And the, squ the, the, the square-based ones, there are square-based ones, triangular ones, and circular ones. And the square-based ones are the oldest ones. The triangular ones tend to be circa around uh, 100 BC to 300 AD. And then the, um, then the um, first of the square ones, then the tripod, and and then the circular ones were 500 years AD and, and to 1,000 years AD. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but this is a photograph that George Osgood uh, helped me connect with a National Geographic photographer in the early 1970s, went down for a graduate student's uh, uh, award of his PhD, and he was doing work on mushroom stones. So they collected mushroom stones from all over Central America, and they grouped them together. And I th this is another symbolism of another mushroom conference, in a sense, you know, uh, sharing the interest in mushrooms. Okay, is the, the, the understanding, well, the, the popular knowledge, even the academic knowledge of, of the use of these mushrooms in, uh, in Mesoamerica, it largely uh, was not known until the work of R. Gordon Wasson and uh, Blas Pablo Reco, uh, who preceded him, who was a Mexican uh, 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 anthropologist who first published some work in the, some of the English language literature. And then R. Gordon Wasson uh, took a lot of his work and then in 1957, May 13th, I've gotten about 50 copies of these, and I like to give them to my friends. Um, you can buy them. It's known as a drug issue if you go to the magazine search you know, companies. Uh, and it has a complete article here uh, on, on the discovery of magic mushrooms. Um, and the editors of, of, of Life magazine, R. Gordon Wasson, uh, demanded and got absolutely no censorship, no editing of his work whatsoever uh, in this. But he... Uh, gave up the title. They could choose their own title. So the, the, the editors of Life magazine chose, uh, I think it says here, Seeking the Magic Mushroom. And this coined the phrase magic mushroom, so to speak, and became extremely uh, popular, mostly through the academic circles of Harvard, Yale, you know, Stanford, uh, University of California, Berkeley, and you know, those institutes of higher learning. Uh, were more aware of this than other people because they were, you know, uh, involved in, the, in academic literature until this was published. And then this arrived, you know, I think 20 million copies showed up, you know, on the doorsteps in the households of, of Americans. And wow, you know, this had a big effect and created a domino uh, interest in, in the magic mushrooms. And this is the famous Maria Sabina, who's a shaman. Uh, there are other people, um, Jonathan Ott in particular, who can speak uh, m uh, with much a greater depth than I on this on this subject. But in here, Roger, this is R. Gordon Watson, Roger M., who's a French mycologist, and in here they publish and it's very, very super excellent uh, watercolors that are taxonomically correct. Roger M. was an artist as well as a very good mycologist. And these are, this is a field guide that, you know, again, showed up in 20 million American households <laughs> as showing you how to, how to identify magic mushrooms in Mexico. Well, um, and, and there's extraordinary reports in here of the visions, you know, of palaces and, you know, all sorts of geometric, all sorts of, all sorts of geometrical fractals and all those great descriptions that we all, all love to, to read and experience. 
Um, so it got, it got a lot of people uh, excited, especially the people involved in the beat generation, you know, poets, the Jack Kerouac age, you know, a lot of those individuals got real excited uh, about this information, including Ken Kesey, uh, et cetera. Um, and so they used this and they, a lot of them went down to Mexico in search of the magic mushroom. They disguised the, the name of the village where Maria Sabina was actually practicing in order to protect her, but many, many people were able to seek her out and find, find her, and she was inundated. The mushroom that was most highly revered in, in, in southern Mexico uh, was this one, which is very, very curious because this is a very petite, small uh, uh, species. It's known as Psilocybe mexicana. It is packed full of psilocybin, very, very low in psilocin. You can jump on this mushroom. It does not bruise bluish whatsoever. Uh, the bruising bluish reaction is a, is, is a classic reaction that typically indicates uh, with dark spored uh, purple round mushrooms uh, that the mushroom is psychoactive. Um, so I find it always very curious that of all the other species they had abundantly around them, many of, most of which were much larger than this and much more conspicuous, this inconspicuous grassland species was the preferred mushroom given as the, the name of the village where Maria Sabina was actually practicing in order to protect her. But many, many people were able to seek her out and find, find her and she was inundated. The mushroom that was most highly revered in, in, in southern Mexico uh, was this one which is very, very curious because this is a very petite, small uh, uh, species. It's known as Psilocybe mexicana. It is packed full of psilocybin, very, very low in psilocin. You can jump on this mushroom. It does not bruise bluish whatsoever. Uh, the bruising bluish reaction is a, is, is a classic reaction that typically indicates uh, with dark spored uh, purple round mushrooms uh, that the mushroom is psychoactive. Um, so I find it always very curious that of all the other species they had abundantly around them, many, most of which were much larger than this and much more conspicuous, this inconspicuous grassland species was the preferred mushroom given the epithet uh, Tenanacatl, which means uh, God's flesh. So, uh, and this is what it looks like. Uh, these are fairly large specimens and it's, uh, they tend to dry out and become hygrophonous. Um, and um, I was able to cultivate it. It was a beautiful mushroom to cultivate, and it has, it's like God touched the center of every mushroom. It was really a beautiful mushroom to grow, uh, but also very petite. And, um, and it's, this mushroom was reserved for the most sacred of rituals. And uh, turistas and, you know, who come down uh, from America and elsewhere in Europe, they were typically given Psilocybe cubensis, or sometimes Psilocybe cellulescence. Uh, and that Slavic Cubensis was associated with the Spaniards and the invasion when they brought cattles, uh, cattle into Mesoamerica. And so it is believed that Slavic Cubensis did not occur until the conquistadors uh, came over. And then with them, they brought spore mass, uh, um, probably from an island off of Spain that was a major uh, trading port for them. So it may have come from India or, you know, you know uh, Vietnam or, or the Southeast Asian uh, group and then came over, you know, the Mesoamerica from there. Gary showed this photograph of mine, it's Slossoby tamponensis. It's really rel relative to Slossoby mexicana. It, it, uh, both of these species form sclerotia. Uh, Stephen Pollock and uh, Gary Linkoff uh, discovered one specimen. Uh, the one specimen that was discovered was uh, uh, cultured uh, by Stephen Pollock and then other specimens, voucher specimens were created and the species was published uh, by uh, Stephen Pollock and Dr. Gaston Guzman. Um, since then, it, had, it has kind of remained in the background until two years ago, and now we, it's been located in uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, along the Mississippi River. So another example of a riparian species. These riparian habitats seem to be fantastic at uh, producing these psilocybin mushrooms. Now, as you'll see in the course of this talk, it, there is a very peculiar uh, association with magic mushrooms following uh, humans. And humans have the dubious distinction of creating probably the greatest debris trails of any organism on this planet. We are great destructors of the environment. And in destroying the environment, we create wood chips, debris, we chop wood, we have fire pits, etc. We make trails, and we have all the spore mass hitchhiking with us. And there is a, a, a flow of psilocybin active species of mushrooms as closely associated with human habits. Uh, and we think that na naturally a lot of these species evolved in riparian environments where there is uh, repetitive flooding, you know, tremendous devastation to the ecosystem, and these then these saprophytic mushrooms, you know, spring into the limelight. 
So I spoke of this briefly. Um, the spores here in the genus Elasobi typically do be uh, are purple brown, and heavy spore prints like this approach black. And this is spores of Elasobi cubensis being collected in Mexico on typing paper. Um, and then the 1970s, a series of books came out, all within a few years. And I'll just briefly describe them. The, Gary Linkoff uh, co-authored this book. My laser pointer's not working. It's the second one down on the left. Uh, toxic and hallucinogenic mushroom poisonings, which was an excellent, still is to this day, a super excellent book. Uh, and really, uh, this is Gary's, I think, his first uh, publication effort. And he did a su super job on it. Um, then on the far upper left is uh, Bob Harris's Growing Wild Mushrooms. Then on the far right is uh, Tanana Capital. Uh, which is uh, re basically different articles by different individuals attending the second psychoactive mushroom conference in Port Townsend, Washington. Stephen Paulus books on the middle right there, Magic Mushroom uh, Cultivation. My first books on the lower right, uh, Philosophy of Mushrooms and Allies. Jonathan Ott's book, Hallucinating Plants of North America. And then a uh, really curious is this one here, The Golden Guide to Hallucinating Plants, what every elementary kid should be acquainted with, you know? <laughs> And we, I still don't know the full story of how this book got into publication, but it's not in publication anymore. Uh, but when it came out, it, it Richard Evan Schultes participated uh, in the publication of this book, and they came out with a golden guide of this. Now, there is a Spanish edition that Jonathan Ott still has access to, for those of you who don't have this book, and many, many of us collect you know, mushroom books. But this is, a, this is a symptomatic of what happened at the time in, in the middle to late 1970s. Suddenly, there was an awareness that these mushrooms not only grew in Mexico, but, and they grew in North America. But because they're little brown mushrooms, and because of their habitats, they were not frequently seen by uh, traditional mycologists, who are mostly uh, identifying mushrooms for pot hunters, people collecting big mushrooms coming in for the table, you know, they want to eat. So when suddenly all these long hairs started bringing in these little tiny mushrooms and wondering if they were poisonous or psychoactive, it was out of their ken of knowledge of these mycologists. They had not seen these species before. They are not familiar with them because many species in the Northwest do not grow in truly natural environments. They're associated with beauty bark. They grow around government office buildings, churches, law enforcement facilities, courthouses. Well, it is very, very ironic that these administration buildings of government tend to be one of the best places to find psychoactive mushrooms. <laughs> so, for instance, in, in uh, Thurston County, Washington State, that the Thurston County Courthouse is, has been the largest patch of philosophy sign essence I've ever seen in my life. And it's right beside the jail. If anybody wants to go to the Thurston County Courthouse, <laughs> you can just rummage right through the beauty bark there and, and in October, and there's a, pl a pl prolific fruitings. Now, this is ironic, and I would speculate that maybe it's because the law enforcement officials started busting people, collecting uh, you know, these wild psilocybin mushrooms, and they, they foolishly concentrate them into one location because they have to go to the courthouse to be you know, you know, uh, prosecuted or processed. And the course of that, concentrating all the spore mass into a, a courthouse facility, well, guess what? You know, all these mushrooms start growing around the courthouse. So um, now, I know several people who, uh, uh, unfortunately, I know, I know two or three people who um, you know, end up going to jail. Um, and one, one of my friends who, um, who you know, for his own stupid reasons, ended up getting uh, in trouble. But he was very, very popular at a state penitentiary because he was the only one who knew, to, who knew how to identify psilocybes. And in the penitentiary environment, was huge flushes of cyanescence and baocystis. So he was like, he, did, he went to prison and he became a god, right? <laughs> and he was really looking at a terrible time stay in prison, but because of his knowledge and whatnot, I mean, people treated them superbly well. Um, so this is Dr. Gaston Guzman. This is Gary um, from Mexico. Gary Menser, then here. I don't remember this individual's name. There's Stephen Pollock. And this uh, friendly looking character here is me. <laughs> um, and then uh, Dale Leslie on the, on the far, far right. This is the contingent that spent uh, two weeks together uh, traveling up and down the, the, north coast, uh, the north coast of North America. And it, literally, we were everywhere we were stopping, we were finding psilocybe mushrooms. It was just a ridiculous series of coincidences that was at first unnerving, but then became the norm. It became normal. At one point, Dale Leslie on the far right was supposed to meet us at the University of Washington at, um, at the botany department and failed to show up. We had a drive to Vancouver, Washington. Uh, we had a drive to Vancouver, British Columbia. We jumped on Interstate 5. We were 60, 70 miles north of Seattle, and we're wondering, where's Dale Leslie? Where's Dale Leslie? And I look over to my right, and there's Dale Leslie driving in a little Volkswagen bug, you know, 70 miles an hour. 
uh, trying to catch up to us, and we were side by side. Coincidences like that happen continuously, and I, uh, it really pushes the envelope here of believability. But many of you who have been involved with these psilocybin mushrooms, you know that these coincidences are the norm, not the exception. You need a, something else is operating here that is, you know, that is not logical in, this, in, the, in, in the linear sense. Okay, a few other books that came out. Leonard Enos's book, which is horrible. Uh, Psilocybin, this book was horrible. This book's horrible. All these books were horrible, except for Gary Menser's book. And Gary Menser died about six years ago. Um, and he, he was kind of a, he and I were kind of uh, taxonomic competitors, so to speak, you know, producing books in opposition to each other. But he did, he did a really good job. Um, and I'm sorry that he's, he's passed away. Um, and then there's my, my four books that I've produced. And, um, and this first book here on the left is out of print. And then the mushroom called a growing gourmet. And then the most recent one that I produced, I actually wrote the book and it was in a, in a filing cabinet for 10 years. I took the book almost to completion and then I put it away. Now, those of you who are artists or writers, like I like Andy and other individuals here, sometimes you just give up on a project. And I put it away and then David Aurora knew that I had this manuscript. And he, uh, Phil Wood of 10 Speed Press was eager to get another book uh, uh, on his, uh, as part of his titles. And so David came to me and says, Paul, listen, whatever happened to that book you were writing? And I go, well, it's right over there. So I pulled the book out and then I re-updated it. And, um, and that's, that book came out, uh, I guess, a year and a half ago, which has had tremendously positive reviews, uh, despite uh, uh, several interesting chapters that I put in the book, you know, like good, uh, good tips for great trips which I thought would actually sink me academically, but as it turned out not to, and I've had a, uh, the, uh, the Harvard Review wrote a really uh, 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 positive uh, review uh, on the, this field guide, and it's widely used around, by universities around the world, uh, because the taxonomy is good. As I'm, I'm happy to say that. The taxonomy is, is real solid. So philosophy, philosophies grow in a wide variety of environments, the grassland environments, the riparian environments, and the woodland environments are the three classic habitats. However, because of the recent colonization of North America, a lot of these habitats cross over. So habitat-specific field guides might work in Ireland, uh, but they don't work really well in North America because here, even here in Telluride, you have lawns on top of wood chips. So you end up getting with wood decomposing mushrooms growing up through the lawns. So uh, field guides that are designed primarily by habitat don't always delineate species properly. This is Psilocybe semilanciata, otherwise known as Liberty Cap. It grows in Washington, Oregon, British Columbia. There's been two reports from upstate New York. It grows uh, throughout temperate regions of Europe, from, from France and England to Italy. It grows in southern Chile, which is a very interesting uh, environment. as one of the rainforest environments. So this is a species that is widely dispersed around the world, typically associated, associated with grasslands, but the fruitings are enhanced if there are sheep or, uh, or cows present. The extra nitrogen seems to increase the fruitings. And this shows you how many mushrooms that you can find. Psilocybe semilanciata is packed full of psilocybin, very low in psilocin. Those species which are high in psilocin tend to bruise bluish. Those which are high in psilocybin and low in psilocin do not tend to bruise bluish. Uh, psilocin is dephosphorylated psilocybin. Uh, and uh, psilocin is, tends to be very unstable. Psilocybin is quite stable. Um, so uh, you'll see more of that. Psilocybin, this, this is a... Uh, a super photograph by Steve Morgan uh, of Psilocybe semilanciata. It tends to have a dark chestnut brown cap. The, these mushrooms are prolific in the Northwest. Um, and I went to Christ Church uh, in, uh, in Oxford, England. And if we can get this in focus here, thank you, George. Um, this, literally over here on the right, there's a wall there. And that's the wall where Humpty Dumpty fell off of, supposedly. And Lewis Carroll was soliloquizing the courtship uh, of the headmaster's daughter. And he wrote, began to write, you know, Alice in Wonderland here. And it was very funny because right in the field adjacent, I found Liberty Caps growing, you know, at Christ Church. And I think a lot of these artists and writers, you know, uh, in, at this time in Europe were experimenting or knew people who were experimenting with mushrooms. And I think it really embellished their writings. Uh, Psilocybe semilanciata tends to be cuspidate, has an acute papilla or an umbo at the top of the, of the a little sharp nipple at the very top of the, uh, of the cap. Um, and then it quickly decomposes. 
It, as it dries, it's, it loses its color, becomes straw color. This is a taxonomically important feature. It's called, it becomes hygrophonous. The cap is hygrophonous. Dark when it's, when it's wet, straw colored when it, when it dries. Um, and this is my brother John here, who you can barely see. He's the one who first got me into mushrooms. He uh, went to Yale, um, and a lot of his Yale, Yale buddies went down, to, went down to Mexico and South America, and he came back with extraordinary stories. And I was only 14, 15 years of age, but my ears were really highly tuned to, to what he was telling me. Um, and he came back, and he was, uh, being in New England and whatnot, he collected a, a, a lot of amanitas as well. So my brother John uh, is really my mentor. Uh, and we spent a lot of times uh, in the woods, and you might say on the ground <laughs> together. So he's a good tripping buddy of mine. Um, and this, this is a real good example. Uh, uh, um, of Slossby Semelanciata well, photographed by uh, uh, Jim Jacobs, and it shows the, the opaqueness of the cap. Now, one of the species that I was able to, to discover and name was this one, Slossby Liniformans variety Americana, uh, and this one uh, is uh, also uh, present in Holland, in the Netherlands, and in Scandinavian countries. Um, and it is a grassland species, and it tends to expand out. And you can read more about the taxonomy of these species, and since time is so limited, I, I really need to move on as quickly as I can. This, this is a very good friend of mine. Uh, his name, I won't give his last name, his first name is Eric. Uh, I know a few people here know him. And Eric uh, is a, one, of the, one of the people who's probably spent more time in the field collecting philosophies than anybody else on this planet. Um, and he told me about this, this species that was growing. And there's a lot of confusion about uh, a species called Psilocybe callosa and then Psilocybe strictopes. I won't go into the, the taxon into the taxonomy of that, but uh, this is a, an extraordinary environment that is, the, is uh, specific to growing grass seed in Oregon. Now, if you go to uh, central Oregon, uh, it's around Salem or so, uh, Highway 20. You can take Highway 20 uh, east uh, of Salem, about 20 miles to 40 miles, and you'll get into grass seed growing areas where they're growing lots of ryegrass seed and fescues, etc. And the great thing about this environment is there's no cows, so there's no fences to keep them in. So it's a totally fenceless uh, landscape that's about 20 to 30 miles long and 40, 50 miles wide. And in this area, as you can see here with Eric, he's stooping down here, but literally in this field was probably more than 1 million Psilocybe strictopes. And you can't see them until you get closer. And then you get closer and you can see there's like 20 or 30 of them right there in a square foot. And the entire field is like that. Psilocybe strictopes is not as easy to identify because it does not bruise bluish. But it has a purple-brown spore print, and as you'll see, it has a separable gelatinous pellicle. So I'm going to give you several ta taxonomic key features that if you memorize or you look at my book, you'll be able to identify these mushrooms to the exclusion of poisonous species. So uh, this is another example of Slosophy strictopes. Very similar to Slosophy semilanceata, uh, but lacks an acute umbo. It tends to be bluntly umbinate. Um, and here's another, another example of it. Also hygrophonous at the, to at the, at the top of the cap. And this is the separable gelatinous pellicle that is typical of many of the temperate species in the genus Psilocybe that grow in grasslands or grow uh, in woodlands. And this separable skin here, you can, uh, uh, very few other mushrooms have it. Um, and as you break apart the cap, this translucent skin that you can peer through it. Uh, and this is characteristic of a huge number of species in the genus Psilocybe. So Psilocybe mushrooms have purple brown spore prints. Uh, many, but not all, have several gelatinous pellicles. And all of them that are easy to identify that contain high amounts of psilocin bruise bluish. So if you know that a mushroom has a purple brown spore print and a bruise bluish, those two conditions met. It is absolutely a psilocybin active mushroom. There are no uh, exceptions to that rule. There's one or two doubtful species, but they're not toxic. But there's no poisonous species. So here's what the microscopically this separable gelatinous pellicle looks like. And it's a translucent skin on top of the cap. And this is a, a photomicrograph. And that layer peels off quite readily. And at the Evergreen State College, <laughs> these people have not lost contact lenses. <laughs> <laughs> and the Evergreen State College, I, I like to call it this, the, the psilocybin state college uh, because of all, all the work that has been done there uh, under the, the tutelage of Dr. Michael Bube, who published some of the best uh, chemistry uh, uh, papers on the proper analysis of, uh, of detecting psilocybin and psilocin uh, from these mushrooms. 
prior to that point, a whole big soup of uh, tryptamines were being uh, isolated, and there's lots of false positives, and people were being busted for mushrooms that weren't truly psilocybin active. So Michael Bug and Jonathan Ott, a number of other individuals there uh, who were in the chemistry department, uh, produced uh, some excellent research papers that were used, unfortunately, by the, by the DEA, but there were accurate research papers that pinpointed the occurrence of psilocybin and psilocin, uh, whereas before the methods were crude and inaccurate. So there's an example of a mushroom that grows. This is a habitat for Psilocybe stuncii, uh, which grows in, um, on wood or, or else on, gra on, on grassy areas that have been put on top of wood. So this woodland mushroom is poking up uh, through the lawns. Because lawns are heavily watered, you know, and you know, that's a great thing about landscaping is because of this need to have green grass, you know, which is really weird. Lots of pieces of people of the world don't, don't do what we do here, but, but yards are a big thing in America. And because the abundance of watering is a perfect microclimate for having a lot of these mushrooms come up. Come up. So this is Slosby stuncii. Uh, there's uh, two varieties of it. Um, it's got a partial veil at the, the, that extends from the cap margin to the stem. Uh, better examples of it are here. Uh, it is not a strong, uh, potent species, however, it grows prolifically. And um, this mushroom was one of the, my, uh, at the time, Jonathan Ott and uh, Dr. Guz Guzman uh, found uh, the, uh, Dr. Daniel Stuntz in the 1960s from the University of Washington sent specimens to Guzman, who was working on psilocybe, saying, what is the species? Uh, Guzman could not identify it. Um, he needed more collections. Jonathan Ott and myself and a few other people provided uh, more collections of it to Dr. Guzman. And then Dr. Guzman named it after Dr. Dr. Daniel Stuntz, calling it psilocybe stuncii. Now, in the field of mycology, there is no greater honor. It is like the Nobel Prize in mycology. There's no greater honor than to bequeath and to name a species after an individual. In the field of mycology, there's no greater faux pas than to try to name a species after yourself. In total contrast to medicine, if you find a, a new, you, you, a new you, a unique disease, then you know, is, is a great pat on your back and a feather in your cap to name a disease after yourself, after yourself if you are a physician. In the field, the field of mycology, that's an extreme faux pas. So, um, is, is, it was a great honor to name the species after Dr. Daniel Stuntz. Um, my uh, older brother, uh, he was, you know, didn't know philosophies. I was doing work at the Evergreen State College. He called me up and said, Paul, I think I found some. And I go, what, John, what'd you find? He says, I found some philosophies. I go, John, listen, it's hard to identify a mushroom over the phone, but let me try. You know, let's talk about the characteristics. Does it have a separable gelatinous pellicle? Yes, it does. Where's it growing? It's growing in wood chips. I go, does it bruise bluish? He goes, yes. I go, what's the spore color? It's purple brown. I go, wow, John, you know, it sounds like you may have found it. And uh, John was not, you know, a good taxonomist, but he knew enough about the language that we could accurately communicate. And I go, well, how many did you find? He goes, you won't believe it. <laughs> I go, okay, I'm driving up. So I, <laughs> I drive up from Olympia to Seattle and uh, my brother John said, you know, he has some specimens there. And I go, yep, this is this new species. It has not been named yet. Uh, it's going to be called Slosby Student CI. We, we do need some more collections. You know, I need about 20 specimens to send down to Mexico. And John kind of laughed. He goes, well, no problem about that. Um, he says, do you want to see the patch? And I said, great. And then he goes, well, we better get some grocery sacks. So he got about 20 grocery bags. And uh, at the University of Washington, you go down University Avenue, you go down the University uh, at the base of the avenue is uh, Boat Street. And at the corner of uh, University Avenue and Boat Street, there is a police substation. <laughs> and this is beautiful. I love this. <laughs> and directly across from this police substation is a little, one of those little power substations, you know, with the little green boxes, you know, and the beauty bark all around them. And I, we, we, we parked by, uh, we, we parked the car and I'm going, John, you know, this is, this is more of cement around here than there is, you know, wood chips. So where is the patch? And he goes, it's right there, Paul. And I go, where? And he's right there. And I look over and I didn't see the patch because there was an eruption of mushrooms so massive that it picked up, you know, garbage, leaves, sticks, an entire new plateau was elevated four to six inches off the ground. And the mushrooms were so solid, they were touching each other. Okay. We jumped out of the car and we started picking these mushrooms and we got two or three grocery bags full. And then pretty soon some University of Washington students come by and they go, what are you doing? Nothing. <laughs> uh, they go, yeah, sure. Let me join in nothing, you know? <laughs> And they start picking, and after you know, after you know, we got about ten grocery bags full of this, you know, uh, and and pretty soon there's 20, 30 people there just massively picking as quickly as possible because they're right underneath the view window from the police station, you know. <laughs> so we want to do this fast and get out of there. So we we 
we, we collected a, a lot of these mushrooms and then, then we began drying them. And, and I, because of time limitations, I don't have time to go through the experience that I had that night. But uh, please read the introduction of my book. Um, it was kind of brave and fun to write that introduction, but it will tell you the end of the story from the great Boat Street patch of Salastabi Stuncii. Um, now, a mushroom that grows coincidentally uh, in the same habitat is the most deadly poisonous mushroom in the Northwest. We also have it here in Colorado. It typically grows in wood chips, same habitat, or directly on logs. It's called Gallerina atumnalis, the, uh, the autumnal Gallerina. There's also Gallerina venenata. Uh, they're deadly poisonous. If you were colorblind, and uh, you would have a big problem distinguishing Slosvistuncii from this species here. Uh, the Gallerinas have rusty brown spore prints. Some of them are bluish black at the base and not because of psilocybin or psilocin. So be forewarned, in the same habitat that you're collecting these magic mushrooms are the most deadly poisonous species in the Northwest. And the most deadly poisonous species in the Northwest tend to be small ones, not the giant, you know, large ammonitas. We have a few reports of, of, of ammonitic phylloides, but that's totally eclipsed by a million fold of what, how prevalent these Galleranos are. They're extremely com common, and I look at these as indicator species. That if I find these deadly poisonous gallerinas, aha, the habitat is correct for psilocybes. So I'm always you know, thankful that I see them because I know that the environment is correct for uh, finding these psilocybes as well. This is what I call the ring of death of the uh, late uh, Dr. Stephen Pollock. And there's enough much uh, gallerinas here to probably kill 20 people. Um, and uh, unfortunately, several deaths ha have occurred. Um, and Andy and myself and Manny were very... Uh, strong in our belief that we should educate the public so if they are going to look for these magic mushrooms they don't kill themselves by mis misidentification. There's a group of mycologists and physicians who believe that these long hairs who are looking for these magic mushrooms if they mistakenly identified them and ate a deadly poisonous mushrooms and died so be it. You know they believe that you know the world's probably better off without these people on the planet and it was shocking to hear physicians you know actually uh, present this point of view. I mean, it was totally irresponsible. And indeed, several people have died because they have delayed going to the hospital environment because some of the physicians at the hospitals would contact law enforcement officials. And then while they're in the hospital, these kids would get busted or these young people get busted because they would have voucher specimens they bring into the hospital for the, for the physician to identify. And once they, they realize it was probably still side mushroom, they contact the law enforcement people. And so these people get busted as they're you know, going through this a, a bad trip. As a result, several people have died now because they delayed going to the hospital and they thought they would just ride out the experience and they ended up dying because of, uh, of the alpha ammonitans and the cyclopeptides in these mushrooms. This is a photograph that I love to show because it shows you how close the deadly poison species and a psychoactive species can grow. This, on the right is the Galleron adonalis, on the left is Psilocybe stuncii, growing so close together naturally in wood chips that they're touching. Now, all of us know many too many eager beavers that will go into a patch like this and collect all the mushrooms. And those are people who are not being killed by these mushrooms may later in life, you know, see tremendous, you know, liver damage, etc. Uh, and so even though you get a sub-death thresh uh, dose, uh, I think it's, you know, it can uh, drastically negatively impact your, uh, your health. Another one is very, very common is Foliotina filaris. Now, be also forewarned for those of you who grow psilocybes outdoors and wood chips, it is normal and natural and to be expected that you will get Gallerina adamnalis and Foliotina filaris, which is deadly poisonous as well, growing in your psilocybe patches. You know, they grow in the same habitat and there's probably a species sequence phenomenon going on here. They tend to go parallel with other, which I think is, is uniquely beautiful about nature to have, to have, you know, heaven and hell, to have death and life, you know, as a, as a, as a you know, complementary yin-yang uh, in, in nature. I think it's poetically beautiful. Because the people who are knowledgeable, the people who are careful, the people who are attentive and are good observationalists can, can t tell the difference. So Foliotina filaris can grow in the grasslands as well. Uh, no reported deaths to my knowledge from this mushroom, but we do know it contains the cyclopeptides that are also present in the deadly amanitas. Another species that I published, uh, Psilocybe sonofibulosa. Um, one of the easiest places to find psilocybe mushrooms is in October, November at Rhododendron Gardens in the Northwest. If you're traveling to the Northwest and you want to find a psilocybe, you know, look up the local uh, Rhododendron Garden in the paper. Very few visitors are there at that time of year, but they tend to mulch a lot. And the rhododendrons like shade, uh, high humidity. They tend to be incorporated into a multi-canopy environment with mixed woods. 
All of those are ingredients for uh, a good psilocybe fruiting. Rarely have I ever not found a psilocybe in a rhododendron patch in October, November. So if you don't want to go to your lo local courthouse or police station, you want to go to someplace a little bit more <laughs> discreet to find these mushrooms, I recommend a rhododendron garden. Uh, psilocybe cyanocrublosa here, more expanded. I'm going to zoom through these. And again, Psilocybe cyanocrublosa, they're growing directly beneath the rhododendron. And so there's a close affiliation of the two of those together. Okay, what's... Yes? Oh, I can? Thank you so much. Because, George, is that, is that stuck? Okay, do you know how to unstuck it? You have to, you have to use that lever and turn this slide carousel upside down and spin it. Be careful because you can drop all the slides out of it. Is this? Um, so there are about 195, 198 species in the genus Psilocybe. We know now that 95 to 97 of which are psilocybin active. So almost half the species, or half the taxa, presently published in the world contain psilocybin and psilocin, which is the largest proportionality of any species in any genus containing those substances. George, I can fix that in a New York second if you wanna, want me to jump down. Just cra crash, the, crash the thing and pull it up. You know how that lever in the center? Do you know that release lever? You got it? All right. Be, be careful when you spin that so you don't, yeah, what's that? Uh, potency wise, the question was, what's the relationship between Semilonciata, Strictopes, and Policulosa and potency? Semilonciata has about uh, uh, one, uh, one uh, percent psilocybin in it, and Policulosa has about 0.25. So there's four times as active. Strictopes has never been analyzed, but from the reports that we've received, it's probably half as active. Uh, lots of mushrooms grow in rings, probably because an, a, a colony started from the center, from one point, and then grew out. And so they often did produce a circular ring. How you doing, George? Uh, let me see, I want to go back a few. Okay, all right. Well, what happened to Baocystis? Okay, that's all right, that's fine. Um, this is a, another species that's collected um, at, at hot springs in uh, British Columbia. Another example of an environment that's going through catastrophic uh, continuous change. Uh, and these things, uh, these lots of these lots of mushrooms tend to be localized in those environments. Uh, we have not identified the species, uh, um, but it's, uh, it's common to a, to a hot springs that's well visited in British Columbia. The photograph by Paul Kruger. So this clearly shows the blooming reaction in the, in the in genus Psilocybe. On the left is uh, on the left is Psilocybe uh, baocystis. We have focus, and on the right is Sinofibulosa. Uh, two different species showing classically the same reaction. The mushrooms bruise bluish. Uh, typically, they bruise bluish in the matter of the more potent ones in the matter of five minutes, but it can be four or five hours before the blooming reaction shows up. If you choose to partake of these mushrooms. I forewarn you right now, they are not something to be toyed with. I, I'm very concerned about the recreational use of these mushrooms. And the one thing that's good about these mushrooms is that they're not addictive and they are self-limiting to some degree because those people who start to ingest them with frequency all know that after a while there's this gut reaction that you don't want to take them again for a while. Uh, Parallel and in contrast with the reaction that every time you take them you think to yourself, I should be eating these a lot more often. So <laughs> I don't know how you rectify those two points of view, but uh, whenever I take these mushrooms, I'm going, I should be eating these all the time. And uh, then after I eat them frequently, then I think, oh, you know, there's this body reaction of repulsion. Uh, you know, obviously these, these mushrooms, as with any potent uh, psychoactive plant, you know, you shouldn't, shouldn't drive, operate, you know, nuclear power facilities, uh, fly, <laughs> fly airplanes, you know. Um, there is a great, great movie from uh, England called uh, Work as a Four-Letter Word. I don't know if anybody has seen this. This guy is working in a steam uh, plant that's powered by nuclear energy, and he buys a mushroom kit from a mushroom mail order business, and he can't get it to work, so he takes it to the steam plant, and pretty soon the entire nuclear facility is taken over by magic mushrooms, philosophy convinces, and he has a great time 
you know, with the SWAT teams coming in to raiding the, raiding the facility, they have to walk past the beds of the mushrooms, and the mushrooms are saying, eat me, eat me. And for reason, all the, all the SWAT teams are, are converted, and then they have great fun shutting down London, you know? It's a, it's a great movie, you know, it's really fun. Work is a four-letter word, you know? It's a, but anyhow, Psilocybe uh, baecistis is, um, is a very difficult mushroom to find. Uh, it hides itself, it's like morels. It's very, very difficult. It has a bru bruising reaction on the stem as well. Pretty potent. A lot of misinformation on baocystis. There's a compound isolated called baocystin, which is also, also another trip to me, you know, uh, indole derivative. And it is associated with a death in Kelso, Washington of a five-year-old uh, kid. Um, it was then uh, used by alarmist mycologists as saying, watch out, these mushrooms could be deadly poisonous. Um, I knew Alexander Smith, you know, quite well before uh, he died. Oh, obviously, I wouldn't know him well after he died. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe I could. Wait a second. Uh, um, so, uh, but the 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 collection that that was published was uh, was not baocystis. It was cyanescence, and the compound should have been called cyanescin, but it was called baocystin because of a misidentification. And then talking to Alexander Smith, he conceded to me that there were gallerinas also growing in that yard. Uh, subsequently, that he, he, when he visited it, and that this whole thing was a misnomer. I described that also in detail in Psilocybe Mushrooms of the World. So for those of you who have heard about this baocystin being toxic, there's no evidence of it whatsoever. Uh, another example of Psilocybe baocystis, and I will zoom forward. And one of my favorite of all mushrooms to witness um, is uh, Psilocybe cyanescens, which has this wonderful undulating cap and tends to be cespitose, which means it grows in clusters. It too, and as well as baocystis, as well as cyanofibulosa, uh, um, uh, as well as strictopes and semilanceata, all have separable gelatinous pellicles, skins. But after the cap dry, dries off, the skin is no longer separable. You have to rehydrate it. Bruising bluey strongly, have strong purple round spores uh, in color. Slosomy cyanescens is, is quickly uh, acclimates to garden and yard environments, the biggest sellers of Psilocybe cyanescence spawn uh, are the soil makers in Washington and Oregon. They have these huge piles of uh, Douglas fir chips, and then they uh, sell them off as beauty bark. And so several times we've been able to trace where these mushrooms have come from because we asked the people where they got their beauty bark, and they got it from a reseller who bought it from a soil company. So we go back to the soil company, and sure enough, around the big piles of, uh, of sawdust and chips uh, are these psilocybes. Now, law enforcement officials have tried to eliminate psilocybes from the environment by using fungicides. Of course, it's you know, very toxic and not, not popular, but give it up. There's no way of waging a drug war against psilocybes and winning. Every attempt by law enforcement has been, is futile because in the course of trying to control mushrooms, they end up spreading them. And uh, so they end up become agents and employees of the mushrooms. So <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful contradiction that it d defies, you know, the, the edicts of law enforcement. You can't suppress these mushrooms because it'd be like suppressing nature. You can't, you know, suppress nature. So, um, and this is one of, of uh, oh, okay, this is one of my psilocybe patches. Um, <laughs> no, there I said it, okay. A long time ago. Okay, now, uh, if you thought Carrie Mollis was interesting, <laughs> those of you here last year saw Christian Wretch. <laughs> and Christian, wow, you know, Christian is one of these intellectual giants of our time. Uh, Andy and I uh, both, uh, you know, introduced Christian as being our good friend. <laughs> he gave, came up and gave an incredible lecture that we had us cowering in the chairs. Um, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's an anarchist and he's an atheist. Um, so, um, but, but Christian has written 14 books now. The guy is incredibly smart, uh, speaks several languages fluently. Uh, and I took Christian, uh, Christian, Christian, uh, I took Christian uh, down to the type locality of a new species that I published with Johann Gartz called Psilocybe azurescens. Uh, it's duly named for my son, Azurus, who's in the audience. And it's also named because of blue fibrils on the stem that before you even touch the mushrooms, this mushroom is so potent that the blue fibrils in contact with the air, or the, the fibrils become bluish in contact with the air and temperature fluctuation. It is literally at the junction of the Columbia River flowing into the Pacific Ocean, which is a catastrophic environment going through all sorts of change. It's windswept. The Army Corps of Engineers planted this grass here called Amophila maritima, 
as a dune grass to control erosion. And at the cusp of the, where the Columbia River flows into the Pacific Ocean near Astoria, Oregon, is the Fort Stevens State Park, which is a 40,000 acre you know, state park where you can rent yurts, you can camp, and even though I put this, uh, there were busloads of people going up to this park uh, several years ago, and the, my confidants who were uh, kind of like my informants, and that is they, they told me first about this, this location, um, I asked them, you know, listen, this is your patch. Uh, do you, you mind if I put it in the book? And at this point, they said, listen, there's several thousand people coming here now. What does it matter? So I put it in the book, and last year, an enormous fruiting, it's lots of azurescence, related to the huge ice storm that we had two years ago coming up uh, out of the Columbia Basin and hit Oregon and Washington and knocked down literally tens of millions of trees, snapped the trees off, and that huge debris layer of broken limbs fueled a Psilocybe fruiting heretofore un uh, never seen by, by, by the people who are experienced in this area. So this is a great place to go. You can go in October, November. The fruitings last until January because the buffering effect of the Columbia River prevents freezing. It's, it's a really interesting place to go. Uh, be careful because law enforcement at Astoria, Oregon, I swear, half their budget now comes from busting people you know, uh, at this location. So, um, and the mushrooms tend to get quite large. I don't recommend putting them into a Ziploc, by the way, but this is all that we had at the time. Uh, one mushroom is probably good for three, four people when it's fresh. Um, it's very, very potent. Um, this is one of the largest specimens that, that was collected. Uh, and I'll show more of it. And there it is, too. It also has a hygrophonous cap. It's got rhizomorphs at the base of the stem. So those of you who saw my first talk on cultivation can draw your own conclusions. Um, and it is a similar to cyanessence, except it does not have the undulating margin. The margin is even, and then as it tries to expand, sometimes it splits, but it has a distinct broad umbo, a low nipple, a blunt nipple at the center of the cap. Uh, and that feature is, is unique to the species. And here it shows it. We also call these flying saucer mushrooms. We also call them fantazitakis, like uh, matsutake, shiitake, nokitake, fantazitakis. So I had a great time with a Japanese mycologist who called me from Japan and uh, talking, uh, talking about, asking me about psilocybes. I go, oh, you mean fantazitakis. So, uh, and, and, he, and he picked up on it right away. And so, I'm sure in Japan now, this name is probably commonly used. Um, so this is a very, very beautiful mushroom. Uh, and you know, I, I will come off on record right now saying that if you're growing psilocybin mushrooms commercially, you're making, number one, a lot of money. You're risking your future. And if you get busted, you have to pay the price because you chose to make the money. If you are growing psilocybin mushrooms for your own personal consumption in your backyard, most of us only eat these mushrooms once, twice, three times a year. It's no big deal. And you don't need hardly, hardly any mushrooms at all. So um, those of you growing these mushrooms commercially, you know, I caution you right now. Um, you know, there's other ways of making money in this world that are safer, better for your family, better for keeping your land, etc., than growing psilocybin mushrooms commercially. Especially when you know what I know now, you know, and just finding these philosophies in natural habitat, I never need to have them. You know, I can just go out into the woods or in the fields and pick them anytime I want to. So, um, you know, I, I, there are several people who have gotten in trouble in the past few years, and, and I'm sympathetic on one level. At the same time, I realized they probably made a few hundred thousand dollars, and uh, I didn't, and they did, and they got busted. They should pay their attorney and, you know, and pay the price. So, fortunately, in Washington, Oregon, because mushrooms are such part of the natural environment, the legal system is very forgiving. Uh, even on the cultivation of Psilocybe cubensis commercially. I know several individuals, and they were threatened with everything, but it came down to it, you know, as probation, a few thousand dollar fine. You know, one person spent eight weeks in, in jail and had 400 dried pounds of cubensis. I mean, so it, it's, you know, mushrooms are looked upon as being different than LSD, different than, you know, cocaine or anything like that by the legal system in some parts of the country, in Iowa and elsewhere, you know, uh, mushrooms are looked upon as drug manufacturer, and they lead, read the law as code. In Washington State, and probably in Colorado for that, uh, uh, in some reason in Colorado, where there's a lot of mushroom activity, it's just another mushroom. So, okay, and the shot of philosophy, um, uh, azure essence. Um, okay, I'm, um, and yet more of it. It just shows you how large it can be. Now, and more <laughs> azure essence. 
And they're so, they have so much psilocybin psilocin that the insect bites uh, turn the mushrooms purple black. And as you can see here, there's a very, very beautiful mushroom to grow. And now it grows in Vermont. It grows all over Europe. It grows all over, you know, North America. It's been reported as far south as Big Sur, you know, for people cultivating it. Again, the spores of these uh, are legal, and there are companies selling spores. Even a person here at this conference who is who's brave enough to sell spores. And my hat is off to you. Uh, I personally wouldn't do it, but uh, I can understand that there is a need out there for people wanting to get access to these things. But come to the Northwest. You'll come to Astoria, Oregon. You can find these mushrooms are everywhere. Um, and this shows you the bluing reaction here. It's so intense, it becomes indigo black because it's so packful in psilocybin. This is the most potent psilocybin active mushroom in the world, as you'll see here in a few minutes. Another mushroom which is bluish and can have a bluing reaction, which is purple-brown spores, is Slosophy aeruginosa. And this Slosophy aeruginosa is a, a mushroom that has intermittent reports of being active and not active. And it may be that the, this blue pigment, which we know now is not a directly linearly derived uh, degradation compound from psilocin, but appears to be a parallel pathway where as the psilocin is being uh, uh, broken down, that this blue pigment is also being formed with a parallel degradation pathway. It's not directly in the same line, but it's a good indicator. This could be the bridge species that explains how that process works. And maybe Kerry, if he's in the audience, he'd be a good person to figure out this pathway. No one's figured it out today. It's a total mystery after all this time. Slosophy pliculosa. There's another, this one that looks very much like tell you, the, what we call telluridensis. This is what I'm hoping that sometime we can find some more specimens of. Very, very common along pathways in the Northwest, uh, along trails. This is a trail mushroom that loves trails. And it loves roads that have been reclaimed by nature where alder trees are growing up. So in the Northwest, if you don't drive down a you know, road in the woods for a year, There'll be alder saplings everywhere, and then four or five years later, these mushrooms will come up when the alder saplings are about 12, 12, 15 feet high. Then Slosophy folliculosa can grow side by side with a deadly uh, poisonous mushroom, Gallimana adamnalis. It just shows that they share the same habitat. Slosophy sylvicula, uh, 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 Slosophy sylvatica is a sister species to Slosophy folliculosa. It's also resident in the same environments. And this is a photograph, I'm not sure who provided it to me, of the, the only specimen uh, of a psilocybin active species that we have found growing in woodlands here in Colorado. And uh, this lone specimen uh, is very polyculosa like as you saw in the previous, previous images. And in culture, it produces these circadian rings that are uh, strongly blooming. Guzman has these cultures, these are his cultures, and he, has, he was sent one, the partial specimen, and in the course of his analyst, uh, analysis, he determined it was a new species because it has pleurocystidia, which are very unique, um, but no more voucher specimens, we can't publish it. So again, if somebody collects it, um, you, I'll give you Dr. Gaston Guzman's address, so you can send it directly to him. And if we get at least two specimens, then we have a new uh, taxon, a new species. Okay, now this is the, my most recent species, and this is the interface environment that these philosophies love. And this is classic, it is a, a, a grassland going into a woodlands. And that margin environment, the interface environment, tends to be the most productive area for finding these psilocybes. And this is, this is from northern uh, Georgia in Cherokee County. And I, this person contacted me uh, over internet, and I rarely ever answer any questions on psilocybes. But I was curious because northern Georgia, there's no reports there's a philosophy of lessons that was found by Montgomery, Alabama in 1914, uh, but there's no other reports besides philosophy cubensis and another one, uh, another philosophy uh, mammalata from Georgia. So this person contacted me and I sent her a, a series of questions fully expecting the person uh, didn't, didn't really have anything of interest and it turned out that she did. Um, and this is this new species uh, named in honor of Andy, philosophy wileyi. <laughs> Which I just like the name, the way it sounds. Wild eye, you know, wily eye. What do you say, you know? I think it fits. It fits perfectly. It's yes, it's very strong. You'll see it, uh, an analysis of it coming up here in just a minute. And it has this um, dark region at the center of the cap, uh, which is uh, uh, real distinctive of it. Now, is this is growing in the back of a person's yard that's in a development in Georgia, right adjacent to a woods. 
Um, I just got a, a photograph from a person in Kentucky, and it looks like now, it looks like, we're not sure, and we don't know for a few more weeks, but it looks like Wiley AI is now reported from Kentucky. So this mushroom, I mean, it's like anything else. So somebody was, gave me a report. They couldn't find any mushrooms on, on Friday, and so they nibbled uh, a little bit of a psilocybe. They waited 20 minutes, and they found mushrooms everywhere. Uh, and it may be that once you've learned to recognize things in the background environment, that this mushroom will become a lot more frequently encountered because people didn't know that, what to look for. It's got purple brown spores, bruises bluish, you know, um, and um, does not have a separable gelatinous pellicle. Um, but when it's young here, it's uh, very similar to some species, um, a species called cellulescence in Mexico. Okay, and it has white margins on the gills, which are very uh, uh, characteristic of many species in the genus Psilocybe. I won't go into those microscopic features. Uh, other people are, are aware of some of my work uh, microscopically with Psilocybes. So this is, the, this is fantastic, you know, that, um, that we can, I don't know how to ex adequately express this, but to give Andy recognition that he's been long overdue because he put his neck out he, and as, as well as Manny, but they put their necks out with the, in, in the community, in their community of physicians and decided to start these conferences because of the misinformation and outright lies that were being propagated on the public uh, 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 by the physician community. And they did, did so at personal risk and uh, under a lot great personal criticism. So I'm, I'm really honored that I was in a position of giving Andy the recognition he so uh, you know, uh, so, so much deserved. Because in 1975, in the Harvard Botanical Leaflet, he published one of the first reports in the use of mushrooms outside of Eugene, Oregon. And uh, that really stirred up a lot of interest because it was one of the first reports of psilocybes uh, growing in that area being used. We knew that they were in the area, but we had very little knowledge. And through his contacts, then it just emanated out from these people who knew these mushrooms that informed other people, et cetera, et cetera. And the last shot of psilocybe wildly. Okay, I'm going to switch to one more carousel. It's 15 minutes after. I started 10 minutes after. Can I, can I have 10 more minutes? Is that, okay. All right. All right. Um, now we're going to jump into different regions of the world. I'm just going to show you that these mushrooms are, are present in a wide uh, number of habitats. Um, okay, this is the northeastern uh, North America. Uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Vermont, uh, up, in, up into Quebec, um, and this is Psilocybe cerulipes. Uh, grows along the Appalachian Trail, for those of you who hike the Appalachian Trail in September, and has fibrils on the, on the cap margin, separable gelatinous pellicle, purple brown spore print, and bruises, bruises bluish. Also is hygrophonous, it's chestnut brown when it's wet, translucent striped margin, little ring, uh, lines on the margin, when it dries it becomes opaque. The, you know, classic psilocybe. Um, this is psilocybe quebecensis, uh, gra growing in the uh, uh, Jacques Carter uh, uh, River Valley of Quebec. Uh, it is reported to be one of the most common uh, species there, uh, growing on, on hardwoods. So I think it's growing on beach. Um, this is uh, psilocybe bohemica, growing in Central uh, Europe. Same classic features, separable gelatinous pellicle, purple brown spore, spore print, bruises bluish. <coughs> this is, um, that, that was Slossaby bohemica, this is Slossaby cervica. Now the photographs I'm showing you, for those of you who are not aware of it, this photograph of Slossaby cervica came from, uh, uh, from Dr. Horik Moser, who published the species Slossaby cervica. This is a photograph of the type collection of Slossaby cervica. I think because of my, my, my big book, Growing Gourmet Medicinal Mushrooms, it got me a lot of respectability in the field, and I was able to contact the authors and the, the, the discoverers of these new species. And they were so kind to send me photographs of the type collections, which are throughout my latest book. So the, uh, that's a real coup d'etat in, in the field of mycology, to have uh, photographs of type collections upon which the species is based. Uh, okay, this is uh, Slossaby uh, subaruginosa. Uh, now I'm gonna. This is from Australia, in Tasmania. It's a big. Here's another photograph of Slossaby subaruginosa. It's a very large complex of Slossaby, similar to Cyanethus, much longer stem. Um, and another photograph by David Aurora of uh, Slossaby uh, subaruginosa. Uh, now there's another species called subaruginescens that I'll talk about in a minute. That's a different species. 
Um, this is a Slosseby Australiana, uh, and Australia is resplendent with these, with these Slosseby's. I suspect that Chile has a lot of species that have not been uh, published. Now we'll move over uh, to Japan. This is uh, Slosseby Argentipes. This is Slosseby venenata, a misnomer because no one's ever died from this mushroom. But the mycologists at that time were not experienced with its effects. And, uh, and it was uh, new of people who had eaten large amounts of this mushrooms and, and were totally unexpected the effects. And so they named it Slosseby venenata, similar to the Polyculosa and Telluridensis, but it's much stronger bluing reaction. This is probably what Telluridensis really looks like, you know, in, in a number of specimens. And then this is a photograph by Gary Linkoff. This is a Subaruginescens uh, from Thailand. Uh, this is Slosseby subserilipes. Uh, this is uh, from northern Japan uh, and Hokkaido. And then Slosseby cubensis, otherwise known as Tropharia cubensis. This Slosseby cubensis is on elephant dung. Uh, there's a big discussion about where was the natural habitat, the natural niche that this mushroom evolved. It probably evolved uh, from, from elephant dung and a giraffe, etc. And, you know, became associated with cattle. And another photograph of Slosby cubensis from Mexico. Uh, Slosby cubensis grows, grows out through southeastern uh, Asia, grows in South America, Central America, in Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, subtropical species. Uh, it can easily be grown. It's the mushroom that most of the people uh, who are you know, growing Slosby's choose to cultivate indoors. It's a majestic and beautiful mushroom with an exquisitely formed partial veil that, that falls. And any of you who've witnessed this, I highly recommend that if you uh, uh, see the mushroom at this young form, sit with it and watch it develop in front of your very eyes. In a matter of an hour, you can watch this partial veil totally drop in slow motion. And it's a really beautiful and extraordinary experience. And I recommend that many of you, before you ingest these mushrooms, that you sit with the mushrooms, you try to connect with them. I believe that mushrooms choose individuals. They don't, we don't choose them. Or more so, I more accurately, when the mushrooms choose us, we have good experiences. When we choose the mushrooms, sometimes the experiences can be good, maybe bad. But I think uh, there is a, a pairing there that uh, demands great respect on both parties. And a photograph by Kit Skates of Slosby Cubensis and jar cultivation was the method that Austin Eric or Terence McKenna and Dennis McKenna popularized through, the, through their books. A uh, photograph by Satit uh, Tai Takun of growing Slosby Cubensis in Thailand on, uh, on rice hulls. Slosby cubensis can be grown on a wide variety of substrates. And I took this photograph at the Maya Bells campground in Palenque, <laughs> because this is kind of typical. There is a conference that we do every year in Mexico that uh, Jonathan Ott, Terrence McKenna, Rob Montgomery, and uh, Ken Symington uh, organize, and uh, Sasha Shulgin, myself, and a number, uh, Giorgio Samarini, Christian Rech, a number, a number of people attend. You can go to our homepage at fungi.com and we have a description of that conference you know it's a lot of fun and i highly recommend it and it's right at the mayan ruins uh, in palenque and then slosby hugasheni this is this is a mushroom that grows in central and south southern mexico uh by a photograph by jim jacobs very very unusually looking uh, looking slosbys slosby azotecorum uh used uh, obviously by the aztec peoples and is one of their preferred sacraments Slosseby hugasheni grows in coffee plantations in uh, the highlands of uh, Guatemala and uh, Mexico, southern Mexico. Uh, very, very pretty golden yellow mushroom. It strongly bruises bluish. It's an interesting combination of colors. Slosseby zapatacorum, which I love that name, zapatacorum. Um, a photograph of Jim Jacobs as well. And this looks like an elf's cap. It's very, very common. Okay, I'm going to just finish up with these few photographs. This is a comparison of the maxima uh, uh, of the maximum psilocybin and psilocin concentrations in Beocystin in uh, about 12 different species of Slosseby. My pointer does not work very well here, but oh, there it goes. There's Slosseby azurescens, which is just way above. The closest species would be Beocystis, then Slosseby bohemica, then Semilanciata, then Cubensis, then I can't see it, and I can't see it, and I can't see it. And it goes on from there. You, these charts are also in the book. More interestingly, you look at the uh, levels of psilocybin and psilocin and baocystin, and you'll see this loss of the azurescence here is just extraordinary. Combined psilocybin and psilocin and baocystin is like 2.5% of its dry mass are these crystalline, uh, crystallized tryptamines. So that's a phenomenal amount 
of this compound. And it begs the question, why are these mushrooms producing this compound? I, uh, clearly, these, uh, these mushrooms are becoming more prevalent because of human interest and human intervention. So um, I think that is a valid argument. These mushrooms are coming into, uh, into being by our participation with them. And uh, insects are attracted to oyster mushrooms, spores, and beetles dig into Pictoporus betulinus. Why wouldn't humans also be enlisted as an agent for spreading the progeny of psilocybes? The parallels are already there. And I think it's part of our continuing symbiosis, but humans have a peculiar attitude of thinking that because they're so complex, that they can't be involved in these subtle interrelationships. And I think that's a really egocentric and false point of view. I think we're involved actively in spreading spore mass of these things uh, and uh, consciously by these mushrooms. Okay, I, I'm gonna I have a whole bunch of sli other slides, but I'm not gonna get through them. Uh, this just came in the mail to me two days ago. And this is by um, uh, Mathieu Nordelus, which is a, uh, a Norwegian uh, mycologist who published this in Microflora. And I show this because um, I'm very greatly honored and I, I am, feel so thankful. Um, he published a short monograph on Foliota, Psilocybe, and Penelis. And in this monograph where he reevaluates the original type collections uh, and he's restudied uh, about 25 different species of uh, psilocybin active mushrooms. In this little monograph that he's produced, he chooses my photographs in psilocybin mushrooms of the world and my descriptions as being uh, descriptions and photographs accurately reflecting the type collections. So uh, Gary and Manny, you know, you all know the, the significance of having your photograph chosen and selected as a typical uh, representation of the species. So um, this, this is good news for me uh, uh, academically because it me means that my taxa now that I've named, including Slossoby wileyi, Azure Essence, uh, Sinofibulosa, Linoformis variety Americana, will now, it's, it's got validation from other mycologists around the world, uh, which means that the, the work that, that uh, I and we have been doing uh, has been validated. So um, I've, I've run out of time. I'd love to talk a lot more, but thank you very much. I want to take a uh, minute um, to acknowledge the contribution of uh, so many people to this event. Um, Gary Linkoff, John Corbin, Carrie Mullis, Rita Rosenberg, Mushroom Strudel, Paul Stamets, Andy Weil, Bill and Karen Adams, Jane and Eleanor Adams, Lee and Linnea Gilman, Art Goodtimes, Paul Kleit, Jason Salzman, Joanne Salzman, and John Sergesi, and many, many others. Uh, I wish I could remember the, the man uh, that Art Good Times brought uh, to bake the mushroom bread. It was just outstanding. And there are so many others who've uh, added to this event that has so many aspects. And uh, we all appreciate every contribution. Um, I also want to remind you of uh, Tom Thacker, who was indicted for mushroom possession, psilocybin mushroom possession, in Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas is not Olympia, Washington. And uh, Tom is faced with the possibility of five years to life in prison for possessing psilocybin mushrooms. There's a box on the um, uh, counter in the lobby uh, where you might make a contribution or uh, pick up the information that uh, would enable you to write a letter in his support. Uh, anyone need a ride from Telluride? Any rides needed? If not, we'll continue in five minutes uh, with Linnea Gilman on photography.